What's up, Cal fans? Patrick Laird here. I'm with author Michael Lewis, author of The Big Short, Moneyball, The Blind Side, and he's here today to talk about you know, a shared passion that we have, which is reading. So first, I'd like to start off by asking uh, what type of in, or what type of genres are you interested in? I know you're famous for nonfiction. Do you read anything else besides nonfiction? Are you a fiction reader? What do you like to read? You know, um, the, the two answers to this question. Uh, what I what I read and what I like to read because okay. I bet I bet three quarters of what I read I read for work okay. and that, so I'm reading other stuff that feeds into whatever I'm, I'm I'm working on at the time and that's so that's almost always nonfiction mm -hmm. um, when I read for pleasure uh, more it's I read more more novels novels and, and history mm -hmm. uh, very you know very seldom do I pick up books that are like the books I write. Really? And I think the reason for that is, I think the reason for this is that when you do it for a living, you spend so much of your time critiquing your own work mm -hmm. that your natural response to anything like it is just to criticize it. And I will actually, I, there are times I've taken out a pen and I start to edit other people's books. Really? Yeah, absolutely. And, so, and, and when you start doing that, you, you know, you're not, jo you're you're not enjoying, enjoying it anymore. It. Okay. You're working again. I, for pleasure, I tend to read novels or, no, or, okay. or, or big fat history books. All right, so can I ask you a question? Yeah, go ahead. How did you become a reader? Hmm. So, you know, one of the main motivators for hosting this challenge has been the influence I had from my parents and my older siblings. I have three older siblings. They're all super smart and growing up, I just always saw them reading. And there's a funny story where I was uh, in our playroom. It's kind of like our, where all our toys and books were when I was younger and I was probably three or four years old. I have this book and I'm pretending to read and my older brother comes in and he's like, what are you doing? Um, so just from a young age, I always saw my older siblings reading and I couldn't wait till I was old enough to read chapter books. And uh, so, you know, when I got this first grade, second grade, we started learning, you know, and you start your reading level increases. I just, I couldn't wait till I could pick up a book and just start reading like my older siblings. And so that was, you know, one of the main motivators behind hosting this challenge is kids don't always have that. Do you find when you're doing this reading challenge and these, these conversations that um, anybody responds by being surprised that a football player is so interested in books? People, uh, they don't like to put it as blunt as that. They try to kind of skirt around the question, but yeah, no, it's been brought up. It's like, you know, do you find it, um, do you think you're the only college football player that likes to read? <laughs> I don't think that's, I don't think that's the case. No, I have of course not. You know, several examples in the locker room. Um, you know, like I told you before, you know, our whole team read the same book this past spring, and I think most guys got something out of it. So I think there's a reader in everyone. That's what I like to tell people. And, you just need to find what you're interested in. No, it's, you know, once you find that, you're, that, you, that you can read and want to read, mm -hmm. it's amazing how many windows on the world open up, right? Yes. But it, that one of the windows on the world that opened up for me writing was, so I've written books about professional baseball, Moneyball, right. and I've written articles or books about football and basketball. And if you ask people, like what's the most literary sport they all say baseball because there are all these books about baseball and because baseball fans are readers mm -hmm. but the actual players there was the, the one of the most surprising things to me was walk into the locker room of the new york giants football team mm -hmm. and like people want to talk to me about other books and, yeah. and they've read them yeah. and and you think wow this is so violates the stereotype and i think the stereotype comes because people think there's violence and it's the antithesis of quiet intellectual life mm. and in fact i don't think at all that's true no. no the violence and the intellectual life kind of can go together in, can. Some, in some weird ways it's uh it's yeah people like to bring up the violent aspect of the sport but the behind the scenes the bulk of our time you know we do practice a lot but the bulk of our time is learning our playbook watching film right studying the other defense so, so it's like you have a playbook the play yeah it's a yes, book it's, a it's book. like the the smarter you are in the sport the more successful. Right. So you can make up for, there's stories all the time of guys making up for athletic deficiencies because of how hard they study and how smart they are in the right. game. So yeah, people talk about football IQ all the time and right. how important it is. Um, so guys will make, you know, a career out of being smarter than, than their opponent or, you know, people in their fellow position group because they understand the game so well. And would, it, 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 they all attest it to studying the playbook and studying film. Would you be willing to make the argument that there's, you have a slightly better chance of succeeding in football if you learn how to be a good reader? I would I 100% make really? that argument. Yeah, uh, that, that's been one of the things that 
it's a common question I'll receive when I go around and speak to these elementary schools. Um, the teachers will ask me, you know, how has football, or sorry, how has reading improved, you know, your personal or athletic life, and usually it's geared towards the athletic life. And um, I think it's the muscle, it's like the, it's the discipline that you build if you're able to sit down for an hour and read yep. a book, or you have a routine. Let's say 20 minutes every night, I'm gonna read, you know, at one, I'm gonna read for 20 minutes, and you build that discipline, it starts to translate into other parts of your life. So I think, you know, the, the guys that are interested in, you know, reading or just expanding, you know, their mind, um, you know, doing self-improvement exercises, and you have to learn all these through, you know, reading of some sort, um, they ultimately do better on the field. How did your coach really pick enjoy. the reading, the book that the team read? So the theme of this off season has been accountability and building like a winning culture. And, you know, we kind of decided that in order to build a winning culture on this team, it's, it's going to be, it's going to come down to our daily decisions. And the Traveler's Gift is about the seven decisions for success. And so uh, he split us up into different groups and we each re read a different decision and presented it to the team. And so the whole idea was get that in the forefront of our minds. Let's read this book together and start talking about what are the decisions that we're going to make as a unit, as a team to, you know, start to build a, a winning culture. So and did everybody take it pretty seriously? Yeah, I think for the most part, there's, um, you know, it became very competitive because the <laughs> first group would go and do a competition, they do, or sorry, a presentation, they do something funny or cool. The next group would just try to one up them and right. one up them. It ended up in becoming like video presentations and it was, uh, it got pretty good. But, you know, I think everyone took the message to heart for the most so part. So the Cal football team has a book group. We had a book, we had a book club this last spring. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, I think uh, the results will be seen on the field this, this upcoming season, which I'm really excited about. Is anybody um, else going to celebrate touchdowns by opening a book? By opening a, uh, I don't know. We'll see if it, uh, if it spreads to the rest of college football. We had kids camps here actually, and so there's stories of kids. I didn't get to work any of them, but there's kids would score a touchdown in the kids camp and start opening the books. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's, been, uh, it's been cool. The response has been awesome. Um, one question I wanted to ask is you have three movies made out of your books. Is there uh, another one of your books that you think should have a movie made after it? There are three that are in various stages. Um, Will Ferrell. So I wrote a memoir about my high school baseball coach, and it was a way of getting at um, the effect a teacher can have on life. Uh -huh. And he was, he, was just a, he was intense, but this wonderful coach. And it's a little, it's a little book. Um, and Will Ferrell just bought it. I think to play the coach and really? I don't know how that's going to work and maybe it'll work and maybe it won't. I suspect he's so funny and so good. I feel find a way. So that could happen. The second one is that is that one is most likely to happen next is uh, Flash Boys, which is mm. about this group of people on Wall Street who see that there's this unfairness has been baked into the system. They go out, try to essentially restore fairness on Wall Street, which is a really weird idea. Yeah. But um, Netflix is is hot and heavy about that and the script's being written right wow. now. So I think, and I think, I think that's going to get made and maybe soon. And then the last one is the undoing project. And, um, there are some actors who were interested in, you know, Sasha Baron Cohen wow. actually was interested in playing Danny, Danny Kahneman. And I don't really? know who they will get in the end, but, uh, I think that because it's, even though it's a story of two, two professors, two, uh, two intellectuals collaborating on, trying to understand how the human mind works. Mm -hmm. um, it was such an emotional story. There, it was basically a love story between the two guys yeah. that, that you, that there's a way to do that as a movie and get at the It'd emotions. Be, yeah. and, the, and as the backdrop's war, I mean, it's war in Israel. There's enough, and they're both soldiers and right. there's enough draw. That I was probably, probably the biggest surprise, reading the book was the biggest surprise about those guys just, they'll pop on a plane and go back to Israel. They're right. at Stanford. Yeah. Think about this. Yeah. They're at Stanford on a sabbatical, and you know what that place is like. It's, uh -huh. It was like that. It was that the same way in nineteen seven in the nineteen seventies, and a war breaks out in nineteen seventy three, and they sneak back in, buying army boots outside the Paris airport, and getting on and ending up in combat, like two days later. So that's uh, the that's the best argument for why Berkeley is better than Stanford, because <laughs> two professors would rather go to war than stay at Stanford. <laughs> That's a pretty good, pretty good argument, I think. I think it settles the debate on which one's better. Uh, all right, I'll, I'll give you that. All right. You didn't, you, but you had me at hello. Well, thank you, Michael, for uh, sitting down and talking about a shared passion that we have. Total and, pleasure. Uh, I hope to see you at some Cal games this year. Yep. So that wraps it up, Cal fans. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all September 1st, and thank you for being a part of this challenge. It's been a, it's been a tremendous opportunity for myself to meet all you and uh, talk about reading. Go Bears.